예, 감사합니다. 이번 예, 사회를 맡은 어, 김선은 교수입니다. 예, 안녕하십니까. 제, 여러분 지금 어, 시간이 늦어가지고 졸리실 텐데 졸리실 텐데 어, 어, 사, 참석해 주셔서 감사합니다. 저 이번에 예, 저 서브젝트는 어, 브레인 서큘레이션에 관한 겁니다. 근데 브레인 서큘레이션이라 그러면 어, 좀 어, 이게 무슨 말인가 어, 하고 생각하시는 분이 있을지 모를, 몰라서 제가 좀 백그라운드를 약간 설명을 좀 드리겠습니다. 아, 그 두뇌 유출, 브레인 드레인이라는 말이 있습니다. 브레인 드레인이라는 말은 어, 이 개발 도상국 그러니까 포인 칸칸트리 저개발 국가에서 어, 머리 좋은 사람들이 이제 선진국으로 가, 가서 공부를 해서 그곳에서 어, 학위를 끝내거나 어, 트레이닝을 끝내서 어, 그곳에서 살면서 이제 거기 경제 이바지를 한 바람에 그 떠난 나라에서 어, 이를테면 이제 이, 이, 에, 투자했던 어, 교육비라든지 그런 것을 받아들일 수 없는 그런 형편이 되기 때문에 그걸 브레인 드레인이라고 합니다. 그런데 브레인 드레인은 틀림없이 그 보내는 나라에서는 나쁜 선택이요. 받는 나라에는 좋은 좋은 것이고요. 그런데 브레인 드레인에 대한 어, 반론들이 제기되고 있습니다. 그걸 어, 말해서 브레인 게인이라고 말하는데 그 어, 어, 이유로서는 첫 번째로 말할 수 있는 것은 어, 그, 어, 공부를 했던 사람, 외국에 나가서 공부를 했던 사람이 돌아와서 돌아와서 그 나라에서 어, 다시 떠났던 조국에 도사, 돌아와서 어, 컨트리뷰트를 하는 경우에 좋은 결과가 있을 수 있다. 그런 의미에서 좋, 좋다. 두 번째 포인트는요. 어, 그렇게 해서 공부를 해서 다른 나라로 가는 것이 그 어, 호스 컨트리 그러니까 는 떠나는 나라의 사람들에게 교육률을 더 높이기 때문에 교육률을 더 높이기 때문에 그 저개발 국가의 교육이 수준이 더 높아진다 하는 그런 포인트가 있습니다. 근데 최근에 와서 브레인 서큘레이션 그런 말을 쓰고 있는데 그 말은 이제 세계가 점차적으로 어, 이 세계화 됨에 따라서 이제 단순히 한 곳에서 있다가 또 다른 나라를 가는 것 그것뿐만이 아니라 다른 곳에 갔다가 또 돌아오는 경우도 있고 또 그런 그 어, 내국인과 외국인의 그 어, 네트워크를 통해서 비즈니스가 이루어지거나 사이언티픽 디스커버리가 이루어지는 경우가 많이 있기 때문에 그걸 일으켜 어, 브레인 서큘레이션이라고 말을 합니다. 오늘은 어, 이게 어, 세분 지금 어, 나오셨는데요. 어, 처음 분은 어, 더크 필라 OECD에서 오신 분이고요. 그다음에 우리 진미석 박사님은 어, 이 어, 회의를 주관하시는 크리베트에서 어, 오시고 또한 분은 이제 그 어, 지창영 박사님이 계신데 에, 지금 좀 늦게 오실 것 같습니다. 그래서 어, 어, 두고 어, 보도록 하겠습니다. 그리고 어, 어, 이따 어, 일단 그 어, 어, 발표자를 일단 시작하고 시간이 없으니까 그 다음에 그 패널은 조금 이따 제가 소개를 드리도록 하겠습니다. 아, 발표자는 15분 15분 아, 네, 해주시면 고맙겠습니다. 15 minutes please. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you chair and good afternoon everybody. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work which we have recently done at the OECD on uh, international mobility. It's about, basically we've just recently completed a publication on uh, the global competition for talent, but I'd really like to give you a bit of an idea of what's in there and what we've been doing in that, that context. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why mobility is important, why it matters for, for countries. I'll look a little bit about the evidence which we have on international mobility, also look a little bit at the impacts of international mobility. I'll look a little bit at policy, what policies currently are in place in different OECD countries in this area, and I'll do a little bit of, of looking ahead because I think there are some really unresolved questions in this area, uh, particularly related to, to circulation of, 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 of brains. Um, why is mobility important? I think we heard a lot about it already uh, during the conference, particularly on the first day. Uh, I think mobility gives people access to new opportunities, to new learning opportunities, so it's really important to increase our own knowledge. Uh, I think it's also important for other people. I mean, it's important because uh, people who have been uh, somewhere else, have been abroad, have, 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 have traveled from, from, from different countries, sometimes bring new knowledge, so, and particularly the knowledge which we can't codify, which we can't put in words, which we can't write down in, in, in manuals or instructions. Uh, but really, the experience of people is really important to learn from. Uh, so that's what we call tacit knowledge, and I think that's particularly important for uh, a particularly important uh, factor in, in mobility. 
And a lot of that knowledge doesn't only spread to the people uh, you're working with very closely, but also to the organization, to the environment, uh, particularly if you are in, in, in an area where, where a lot of uh, people work together. Um, what drives mobility? I think there are many factors why people move abroad, why people try to gain experience in different countries. Uh, it's about economic incentives. Sometimes it's about better conditions uh, economically, of course. Often what people tend to ignore, personal family reasons are very important factors in mobility. A lot of people move abroad because of their, their sort of, they get married, they find they have a friend or a boyfriend or whatever. Uh, uh, then of course, if you're looking at researchers, uh, the research infrastructure, funding, uh, access to, to really important scientists, but also the freedom to debate in different countries can be reasons why people move abroad to, to do research. And then I think sometimes ignored social and cultural factors matter as well. I mean, people are looking for places, particularly highly skilled scientists are really not only looking for is the research infrastructure okay, but they're also looking for is the environment in which I will be living, where my family will be living, really a nice environment to live in. And that, that is, I think, is, is, is quite important as well. Now, all of that, of course, uh, differs by the area which we are, we're looking at. Some evidence, uh, we know a little bit about international mobility. This is a chart from our report and, and what we're, we're looking at here is basically the expatriates from OECD countries which are living abroad. Now what you see here is for instance that in a country like Ireland, more than 25% of the highly skilled in Ireland are actually living abroad at the moment. Uh, if you look at uh, on, on, on the, on the, the left-hand side, uh, you will see that, for instance, in the United States and Japan, only a very small percentage of the highly skilled are actually currently living abroad. Unfortunately, no data for Korea in this chart, but I'll show you a little bit more about Korea in a minute. We also have some uh, data about arrivals, so people from uh, other countries which basically come to OECD countries, where you can see whether these people come from OECD countries or they come from non-OECD countries. And here you see that, for instance, in certain countries, Luxembourg, Switzerland, a very uh, large percentage of the highly skilled in those countries who work in those countries come from abroad. They come from different countries, sometimes from OECD countries, sometimes from non-OECD countries. If you look at the dark bars, uh, for instance, in a country like Canada, 20% of, of, uh, of, of the highly skilled basically come from outside Canada, but from non-OECD countries. So that is an important factor in, in, in these countries. Again, uh, Korea is actually in this chart, you see that Korea has very low uh, percentage of highly skilled uh, from, 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 uh, from outside uh, uh, Korea. We also can look at the balance, of course. We can look at how this all fits together, which countries are really gaining at the moment in terms of attracting highly skilled uh, uh, in, in different countries. And you particularly see that a lot of the Anglophone countries, the United States, Australia, Canada, have a large number of highly skilled from abroad. So if you look at completely at the left-hand side, uh, countries like Mexico, Poland, and also Korea, have, are losing slightly more people than they are gaining uh, uh, nationally. We can also look with this data of uh, non-OECD countries, where are people are coming from. So if we look at this chart, basically in the OECD countries, about one million highly skilled people in 2001 were from outside the OECD area. In the US, uh, out of that million people, about 700,000 uh, 700, Indians have gone to, to the United States. Uh, also uh, quite large uh, numbers going to Canada and the UK. This data tells us something, but it's only looking at OECD countries because we don't have the same information yet for, for some of the developing countries and trying to get a better understanding uh, of mobility there. We can also look at student mobility. I think this is very important. This is really, of course, is a factor sometimes before you get to the highly skilled really moving to countries. This is, has, has risen very quickly. Uh, between uh, 2000 and 2005, it's risen by about 50 percent. Uh, 2006, the numbers are again a lot higher, 2.9 million uh, students which are actually living abroad, are working abroad, uh, mainly going to OECD countries, but many coming from non-OECD countries uh, at the moment. Uh, a lot of the migration which we're seeing is also short term, as a lot of it is return migration. People sometimes say that they will leave a country forever and not, not come back. But in fact, they do. Uh, the evidence for Australia is, for instance, 75% of people who say they will really leave the country forever do actually return at a later stage for a variety of reasons. And I think 
very similar to what we talked about earlier, family, personal reasons, they matter. Uh, sometimes people come back for those reasons. Uh, sometimes because people feel too distant from their own culture, from their own background, so they come back for that reason. And sometimes also because the conditions in the country you left from may leave over, uh, may change over time, and you may come back at, at a later stage. And uh, perhaps an example of this is, is China. If you look at uh, China, for instance, uh, we look here at the number of Chinese researchers leaving the country and those coming back, and you see that the ratio of Chinese students coming back has recently increased, partly, of course, because China is also uh, spending more on R&D and the conditions to come back and, and do research in China have changed over time. Um, impacts, I think, if we, we know a little bit about how uh, this is affecting uh, countries, uh, I think partly a lot of, of course, the countries who are trying to attract uh, people from abroad are trying to help the, use this to attract, to address uh, labor shortages, to really fill gaps in, in, in their system. Uh, sometimes that, that can have a really important impact. I think if we're looking at the highly skilled, at the researchers, there are many other benefits or, or, or factors which, which help uh, in, in these countries. You can have an increase in R&D activity if you can get the researchers, because that's a, a, a big problem in many countries. You can have knowledge flows from countries, between countries, if you have a lot of mobility. You can have firm and job creation. I mean, I think we've seen, for instance, in the, 19, the end of the 1990s, a large number of the startups in Silicon Valley were basically based on Indian and Chinese researchers, which were actually setting up uh, businesses in, 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 uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, we also know something about the impacts on sending countries. Um, there's probably a little bit less uh, of an evidence on the impact of, of uh, immigration on, on the labor markets. We typically look at things like brain drain, which is very, I think, damaging for certain countries, particularly if you look at, for instance, doctors and other highly skilled. If you look at researchers, it can be a little bit different because sometimes it also depends on what, what the conditions for people are to do, actually do research in these countries. I mean, if they have a better condition outside and then they can help their own country, it may be actually uh, not, not such a bad thing. Um, there are some, uh, I think, other things going on here. I think we, we, we just heard from the chair, brain circulation. I think this is happening in some countries where people are starting to come back, depending on the conditions, and it's something which I think needs to be promoted uh, much more uh, further. Another factor which I think, in, in, at least in the European context, is becoming quite important as, as part of the discussion is the, is the word diaspora which is basically means that you're trying to benefit from the people you have abroad. So basically, if you have lots of Korean researchers abroad, you're trying to basically draw on that network, the network, uh, the, the, basically the skills, the experience, the networks they have, and bring some of that, that, that experience back to your own country, even if people don't come back to your country straight away. And there are co countries who are really starting to think about this and trying to bring that knowledge back to their own country. Um, I won't take you to, to all these charts. I can leave the charts uh, if, you, if you like. I think we have some evidence that this uh, mobility is good uh, for, for, for countries in terms of the quality of scientific output, uh, that it is good for innovation, that it plays a role in, in innovation, that, that sort of uh, innovation benefits from, from having uh, more people involved in, in innovation. And we also know something, of course, that it has an impact on, on sort of the whole uh, scientific discovery which is going on in different countries. Um, I think if we look at policies, and partly I'm speeding up a little bit to, to get to this point, is um, I think if we look across OECD countries at the moment, mobility is really seen as an important thing to, to, to have policies for, but very few countries really have strategies in this area. Uh, it's very much a scattered uh, approach to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to really get uh, highly skilled uh, researchers to come to, to, uh, to countries. Very few countries, as I mentioned a second ago, have strategies really also aimed at the diaspora, trying to attract or at least work with the people who are already living abroad from different countries. Many countries have some special procedure to attract highly skilled in terms of immigration procedures, in terms of recognition of qualifications, sometimes social and cultural report to try and uh, bring uh, 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 highly skilled researchers to, to, to their country. And also, of course, a lot of institutions, universities are trying to attract these people by, by different types of, of support, like helps with visas, housing facilities, travel grants, other types of, of programs. And there are quite a few countries, and I think this is also uh, an issue which is being looked at in, in the Korean context, which are more special programs, like in Canada, the Canadian Research Chairs, which is really aimed at trying to uh, bring Canadians back to Canada to give them a more competitive environment to, to work in. 
Uh, a lot of this is pretty piecemeal. I mean, if you're looking at how important these programs are, how many people they're, they're affecting, it's very small com 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 compared to the uh, total international mobility of the highly skilled because uh, between uh, 1990 and, and 2000, we're basically talking about five million people moving across countries sort of uh, for, for a longer period. And a lot of these programs only affect a few thousand people. So it's, it's, it's quite small in, 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 in the total effort. Um, I think some of these programs can be improved. Sometimes uh, some of them are very short term. So basically people don't move for just a very short term year grant or a half a year grant. They will only move if they have a bit of certainty for, for a longer period. And I think we, we still see that there is a lot of scope for improvement in some of these programs across countries. I think where some of the gaps are at the moment where we need to think about more and, and I think where we need to look ahead is that uh, currently a lot of the policies are really aimed at attracting people. Uh, they're not necessarily aimed at sort of also sending people abroad. Uh, so they're, they're, they're very much trying to attract people but not necessarily recognizing that mobility abroad is very important as well, that you, mo you really do need to send people abroad to try and uh, stimulate mobility. Uh, a second point, I think, is that everybody's trying to compete for the same people. I mean, we're all trying to attract the same highly skilled researchers. And many countries, I think, uh, facing a, a problem here now because uh, particularly if, if you look at the U.S. situation where uh, which the U.S. has really sort of benefited very highly from, <clears throat> from, from attracting a lot of these researchers. But now the same is happening in Europe where Europe is trying to attract these people. <clears throat> it's happening in, in, in Asia where... Asian countries are trying to attract these people. And the question is whether that will really uh, sort of uh, uh, work out in the long term in terms of really trying to address the shortages. So what will hap need to happen, I think, as well, is that countries like in, in, in Western Europe, in the United States, will have to look at their own problems as well and try to sort of see whether they can increase their own supply of, of, of highly skilled researchers. Um, I think the other point which is, is important in, in, in my mind is that there are some real gaps here in terms of really the policies to get circular mobility, to really get people moving across countries to, to build on these di diasporas. And another point I think is important is that if we want to do that, if we really want to also give uh, more uh, sort of uh, help some of the developing countries which are currently losing a lot of people, then probably it needs to also involve development assistance programs, development aid to give more attention to, to highly skilled people and to, to use those to uh, build sort of research infrastructure in developing countries so that people have more reasons to stay uh, back in their own countries. Uh, so I think in summary, very briefly, uh, I think mobility of researchers leads to flows of knowledge that benefit or can benefit both sending and receiving countries. It's not necessarily a zero-sum game. I think it's something which, which can be beneficial to all if we do it properly, but we need to work on that. Um, I think that the flows of, of, of highly skilled people and students are very high for some countries uh, with, with an also an increase in circular and, and return migration. Uh, mobili mobility is accompanied by uh, increasing internationalization of labor markets, of research and also of scientific activity and it is growing which means that I think we need to focus more on getting our own policies in different countries uh, right. Now, that's just a, a brief summary. You can find a lot more in this report which we uh, recently published at the OECD. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Doug. Jim Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I know it's a lot of material. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But you got a lot of good, nice points. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Misak Jin, and working at um, CRIVET as Director of uh, Human Resources Development. Uh, today, uh, my, uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the international mobility of uh, the highly skilled in general and introduce the Korean cases for brain circulations. And I will talk about a little bit about policy implications. Before starting the main theme, I would like to point out the definition of the highly skilled. It is very unclear and very uh, much uh, the, um, confused, actually. Depending on the researchers, depending on the institutes, uh, they, are diff they are using different concepts. Uh, in some cases, uh, they use the 
definition who are who are who have the higher education degrees such as PhD or university bachelor degree degrees or in other cases uh, uh, they are referring the the people who are working in in, the, in some occupational areas such as IT sector so um, <clears throat> Today I will focus on the PhDs, PhD holders, because they are they must be in, in must be included in the highly skilled by any standards. Okay. So as Dr. Pilot and uh, <laughs> Professor Kim already mentioned that uh, the importance of international mobility of uh, human resources. Say um, advancement to knowledge by knowledge-based economy. The high skills and knowledge, the the uh, is very important, and uh, the highly skilled in R and D and service areas are really matter for economic growth you know, of one country. And also, there are various reasons for the increased mobility. Anyway, people are moving around very much, very frequently. So many countries are now in the situation of war for talents. Along with uh, the increase the mobility and uh, the the and also the, the the pattern of mobility has been changed. So nowadays research has, has began to take the perspective of brain circulation. Let's talk let's see the 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 difference between between brain drain perspective and brain circulation. The moving direction for brain drain only for, uh, basically it's a unilateral from developing country to advanced countries. And benefits, it's a kind of uh, zero-sum game. Some are win, some are losing. And pattern is uh, quite prominent as, uh, say, immigrant, immigrant. And also that the strategy to focus is that to make them home or blocking brain drain to hold uh, human resources in their own countries. That was a brain drain perspective. But right now, it's, uh, we are starting to take brain circulation perspective, which is uh, the direction is bilateral or multilateral, from advanced to advanced, from advanced to develop, developing countries. And also the, the benefits from exchanges human resources are both win and win. And also the pattern of movement is multiple and transitions. People are moving around all, all several country, countries and several times. And the strategy is focused on the global collaboration, which is called the global diaspora. Making them, making expatriates to collaborate with domestics. Okay. So here I summarize the, the positive and positive and negative effects of uh, both sending countries and uh, receiving countries. And also the brain circulation focused on, I mean, look at the global effects of human exchange of human resources, okay? By uh, making the glo uh, global mobilities, uh, we can contribute to development of knowledge and R&D for the whole world and for better job matches for workers and uh, employers. And also to, um, to increase individual human capital investment the world, around the world. Okay. Now let's uh, see the brain circulation in Korea. Actually, Korea has been changed from only brain gain country to brain circulation one. It's, uh, five years, during five years from 1980 19 to 1984, the foreign doctor PhDs in of among total PhD in Korea takes about almost 30 percent, and it goes up to 40 percent of PhDs. And now it has been dropped to 20 percent of um, or, uh, the foreign doctors takes up only uh, 20 percent of all whole uh, PhDs in Korea, and also Korea starts to receive the foreign student, uh, student. In 2006, 1,200 foreign students are here in, for graduate programs. Now Korea is both sending and receiving countries. That's why we are, it's a more 
prob uh, more uh, better to take brain circulation perspective to understand Korea. Actually, the, and uh, I focus on the, um, the the Korean PhD in USA. The the PhDs who received their doctoral degree, but they graduate the college from uh, in Korea. They just uh, went to uh, went to USA to get their degree. During the last 20 years, about 1,300 to 1,500 Korean PhD in the USA a year. That's uh, the second largest foreign countries who produced um, PhD in the, U in the United States. And uh, about 700 to 900 PhD a year in science and technology. Okay. This is the trend of Korean PhD of total uh, US uh, PhDs. And the Korean PhD, some uh, survey on Korean PhD show that they are highly selected human resources. They are mostly likely from higher family as, uh, socioeconomic status, and they are more likely to graduate from selective college in Korea. And they are more satisfied with their U.S. graduate program than domestic counterparts. Especially, they are satisfied for quality of curriculum and also financial assistance. And let's see. Let's talk about returning of Korean PhDs. The, to, the, the data by the National Science Foundation in USA show that the proportion to plan to return home on completing their degree has been decreased. 2004 is 26, only 26 percent of PhD in science and technology, and 46 percent of non-science and technology. It has been decreased actually, but still is very high compared with uh, other countries such as China, India. China and India has um, the the PhD of Chinese and Indians. Uh, they only they only less than 10 percent are planning to go, to go back home. Okay. Actually, the plan rate has been used for the, uh, raising the issues brain drain uh, phenomenon in Korea right, uh, recently. But let's look at the actual return rate of Korean PhDs. This is uh, the rate, state rates. State rates, state rates five years after their the uh, degree completion. 66 percent of 1998 PhD cohorts went back home, but 80 percent, 89, almost 90 percent in uh, uh, 1992, 1993 cohorts went back home. Almost the state rate increased uh, double, or almost uh, three, triples. Much, and the actual and also actual rate of return, actual return rate is much higher than planned return. Okay. So we have to think about what does it mean. Is it is this a rate return rate too low to be worried? It's a very difficult to to say to answer. And also, is it negative? It depends on the the three questions. Who are staying and why? And if they are staying permanent or temporary? And what about the quantity and quality of collaborations and linkage of expatriate PhDs with home colleagues? Okay. The state, actually the state rates of foreign, uh, Korean PhDs is much, much lower than uh, Chinese and Indian, Indians. Uh, not, too high, not too high rate of uh, stay compared with uh, the average foreign PhD in USA. Okay. And also we can see the, the tendency that uh, the PhDs are likely to stay long, even if they are coming, I mean, finally they are went back home. Okay. That is, we, uh, let's, let's look at the, the high proportion of postdoc of Korean PhD, PhDs. These days, postdoc pro is kind of, um, uh, 
essential program, necessary, uh, compulsory program for some PhDs who want to be researchers, who want to be professors. So many PhDs who are taking post, uh, postdoc programs are staying in the States. Okay. That makes the, their plan rate, plan return rate uh, makes lower than, you know, uh, actual rate of, actual return rate. And let's talk about the factors of returning or factors of staying abroad. We can say that we can uh, differentiate uh, pulling factors to make them come back home. First of all, that's a favorable job market, especially there, if there are a blunt opportunity to become professors, they are likely to come back home. Okay? Uh, compared to other countries, Korean PhD are more and more likely preferable to become professors. So if in Korea, Korean context, the, the, the job market for academia is uh, quite good, they are more likely to come back home. But if it's not, they are more, less likely to come back home. Okay? And also it's a very unique uh, feature of Koreans. It's a kind of patriotism or also family duties. Uh, some of PhDs, Korean PhD answered that they have to come back home because of their parents. They have to serve their parents. That's uh, cultural factors. And the pushing factors to make them, uh, to keep them from returning. Is, uh, uh, first, the most important thing is research conditions, you know, research climate. And research climate, research culture, they complained that about the research culture, the rigidity and hierarchical, and uh, short-term profits pursuing uh, perspective. Uh, those are the, the barriers to uh, hinder the creative work and the research. Okay. And also, they said that uh, the PhD said uh, it is very difficult for their kids, for, for the children's education. The, co the quality of education for children is very low and very highly competitive and very expensive private tutoring. Those educational factors for their kids uh, as uh, one um, barriers to come back home. Okay. Look at um, here, the returned PhD in Korea are more or less satis satisfied uh, with their working conditions. See, here PhDs in, the, in USA say that um, semi, almost 70% are working the job which requires a PhD degree. And higher than, 20% is higher than PhD degree. But in Korea, 70% are, they are working they are working for the, the job which requires a PhD degree, but they are working for the jobs which requires less than, less than PhD degrees. And basically, they are, uh, high, they are lower job satisfactions, especially for the uh, workers in, uh, working in private companies. And I, also, we have the, some question about uh, who are staying in the States, in the United States. If you had returned to home, what happened to your research and quality of life? 80% uh, or almost 70, 70% uh, seven say that, you know, if we had returned to home, our research products uh, be, uh, uh, were much lower than now. And also they may have lower quality of life. Okay, those things, uh, these uh, data show that uh, raise the issues uh, is it good for them to come back home, for them or for globally? Okay. So I will briefly introduce Korean cases. Now let's talk about uh, policy directions. First of all, I, want to, I would like to uh, point out we have to change the, 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 brain, the, the policy paradigm from brain gain, brain gain paradigm to brain circulation paradigm. From closed and nationalistic, just to focus on only Korean human resources. But now we have to be open to anyone who are, you know, who are 
good, uh, excellent human resources, uh, which is called global sourcing. And we, we, have to, we, we focused on only recruiting and attract, attracting people, but we didn't, they didn't hit, we didn't pay attention to what happened after they're returning home, okay? What happened to utilization of them? Of them? And also we have to uh, focus on the, the quality of the human resources. We have to focus on the who are really need. What kind of human resources are we, we, are, are we needed? We have to figure out that, uh, that uh, quality issues. And also we have to think about the government, government have to, has to think, of, to think about striking balance between making human resources and buying human resources, which is uh, short-term short versus long-term human, human resource uh, policies. Okay. And there are several, I mean, <coughs> strategies uh, for uh, effective human resources development and utilization. First, I, should have, uh, I, I would like to focus, I mean, emphasize the strengthening of the competitiveness of universities. So university is very important which can attract the future human, the highly skilled human resources and also the present, present highly skilled human resources. And also we have to improve the work and research climate, climate to utilize uh, the creative talent to work creatively. Okay? And also we have to strengthen foreign network to improve collaboration and uh, global cooperating for researchers. And finally, I find that least importantly, I want to make emphasis on the efforts for data and information. We really need global co collaborations in order to know what's going on uh, between sending and receiving. Okay? So now uh, I would like to introduce uh, car uh, careers of doctor doctoral uh, holders. Uh, it's a jo pilot joint program, project administered by OECD, OECD and UNESCO and um, uh, Eurostat. It's an international com compar comparative uh, analysis for uh, careers of doctors. Okay, we are participating in two. Okay, um, uh, let me conclude. Uh, I will, I mean, I'm, I'm done, okay? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. 지창용 박사님, 어, 지금 어, 제이, 제미 한국과학기술자협회 차기 회장이시고 어, 미국 노스캐롤라이나 주립대학에서 어, 교수님으로 계십니다. 네, 우리 지 박사님은 어, 카이스트에서 PhD를 하신 것 같습니다. 굿 아프터눈 에브리바디 퍼스트 아이 어폴로지아이즈 비커즈 아이 워즈 어리들 빌 레이트 듀 투썸 이머전 미팅 저스 비포 디 세션 아이 고잉 투 토크 어바웃 디 인터내셔널 마이그레이션 앤 네트워크 오브 코리안 아메리칸 사이언티스 앤 엔지니어스 아이 마이 셀프 이즈 에즈 디 체어맨 인트로듀스 디 I'm sort of uh, brain uh, made in Korea because I got PhD from Korea, KAIST, and then uh, I went to United States. Uh, first I went to uh, Stanford University and stayed there four years. And I went to uh, City New uh, University of New York one year before I went down to uh, North Carolina State University uh, 21 years ago. So I was in America like uh, 26 years. So I'd like to base on my uh, personal experience and talk about this uh, brain circulation. Um, this uh, organization that I'm involved, I happen to be uh, elected as uh, president uh, in 38th term of Korean, Sci Korean American Scientists and Engineers Association. And the abbreviation is uh, KSEA. Um, so I think, uh, Based on my uh, like more than 20 years of experience, I made something about uh, this uh, trend of uh, international 
migration and network of Korean American scientists and engineers. So I'd like to base on first uh, some uh, demographic backgrounds of US and brief history of immigration. This includes uh, generally the Asian immigration and demography because the scientists and engineers are human beings. So therefore we are uh, not an exception and we'll be involved in this uh, demographic uh, data. And then I will uh, mention about briefly, uh, this my personal experience of uh, uh, KSCA. And then uh, from that, I can say something about the reflection on uh, my KSCA activities. And then I'll, based on that, I make some concluding remarks. Um, if you go on to Google and type uh, population clock, then you can watch out actually right now how many people are living in US and also in the world. I did that in March 15, 2008, and then I got this number. US population is around 300 uh, million people, and worldwide about 20 more, uh, or 20 times more people are living nowadays. If I calculate, I think uh, in 10 years, looks like around uh, 30 uh, million people are added uh, to this uh, US data. So as you can see that the uh, US to total population in April 1 of 2000 is, uh, uh, it's not completely one year, so it's slightly less than 30 million less. And then if you look at uh, uh, 1990, US to total population is uh, that, uh, around 20, 250 uh, million. The reason I talk about this is uh, to compare with the Asian population. Of course, Asian population uh, compared to the general US population is, uh, is a minority, of course. So it has about uh, uh, 12 million. Uh, this is the data of April 1 of 2000. It's about uh, 4 uh, to 5% perhaps. And then there is uh, these uh, orders of uh, different countries from Asia, and then Korea is at that time it was like a fourth place and so forth. Now, if you compare the population growth, although we are the minority, the gradient of population or the slope of the increment is uh, far more than US population. So you can actually see that uh, big growth compared to 1990 to uh, 2000, you can see that the Asian population grew a lot. And uh, this is remarkable. And then another interesting aspect is that the age of uh, Asian population is much younger than the general population of the US. So uh, if we count that the Asian only, perhaps it's like uh, three, three years uh, younger. And if you co uh, combine the Asian and American mixtures, uh, like uh, second generations and so forth, you get like a 30, even younger, 31 years and so forth. So that in general, that the Asian uh, uh, immigration is uh, sort of like a newer and uh, vibrant and uh, very active. It's a young people. Actually, you will see the reminiscent of this thing in the, uh, the data for the Korean uh, KSEA, the population that we have. KSEA has around uh, uh, 10,000 uh, Korean American scientists and engineers working there. And then you will see that the age of uh, 30 to 40 are the dominant population of those uh, in this organization. Uh, actually, if you look at the map of US, uh, there is uh, you know, Asian population spread all over the place, as you can see here, uh, especially the darker uh, region is more dense uh, in Asian population. Of course, historically, this Hawaii uh, has lots of uh, population there uh, because of the history, and then also Alaska and so on. Of course, we have a large city like uh, LA, New York, and so recently also Washington, DC, and so on. But one of the things that I can mention is uh, San Diego, for, his, for example, 
is, uh, is not regarded as a big city. It's just among small, smaller cities in the U.S. Nevertheless, among those uh, smaller, uh, popul uh, smaller cities, San Diego is stu stood out. It's the highest population of Asia, Asians there. So you can actually see in the West Coast and also East Coast, uh, people are more accumulated. Also, there is a history of uh, immigration, and there is uh, ups and downs uh, to U.S. And uh, of course, there is uh, obvious reasons for these uh, dips in the immigration. That's uh, because of uh, uh, world wars. For instance, World War I and World War II, uh, this uh, immigration dramatically dropped. And then also, we can see that how the homeland does make a big effect on the policies in U.S. For example, in World War II, the famous uh, this Pearl Harbor attack from Japan in 1941 <coughs> made Roosevelt to uh, order this executive order 1966. It's a kind of penalty to the Japanese people because they uh, did the Pearl Harbor attack. And that effect, of course, the Japanese uh, immigrants in the uh, U.S., of course. And then later uh, in the era of uh, Ford, uh, this uh, executive order was abolished. And then, of course, Japan asked for uh, the you know, payback to the Japan for uh, this act. And uh, uh, that's what's uh, happening. So that there is a, a very important issue that uh, how the homeland of that immigrants are doing, that make a big effect to the immigrants who are living outside their homelands. There is a long history, and then I'm not going to go over all the histories. Uh, Chinese and Filipinos uh, started this in even 1600, uh, they started uh, uh, immigration. Um, Relatively speaking, that Korea immigration is newer. Actually, officially, we think that the 1902, when King Kojong recognized the approval of immigration, that we regard that's the starting point of our immigration to US. So actually, some of you may notice that uh, 2002, we had a, a celebration in Washington, DC, and also all over the place in US and also uh, uh, President of the United States recognized this, uh, this 100th uh, anniversary of a Korean immigration. And then there are many uh, celebrations uh, we had in the US. Um, as you can actually see that uh, this uh, uh, period of early immigration, I will mention about a few evidences for that, but these early immigrants uh, we are really hardworking people, and they day and night uh, just work, and they want to just to survive. And there are many reasons for that, and then I will mention those things. And then also in early days, some of the patriots like uh, uh, An Jung Gun, uh, he came to U.S. and then make this uh, Kong Nip uh, sort of like uh, history repeats. I'm working as a KSEA, Korean American Scientists and Engineers Association, but this is kind of precursor of such an organization in the US. It's a voluntary uh, organization. I'm not working for the money for this uh, uh, type of organization. I'm just uh, working because of my mind. And uh, uh, they did too. Okay? It's uh, entirely voluntary, no pay, but just they work for because of uh, the home country and uh, uh, people and culture and so forth. And then they make this Gongnip uh, Shinbo uh, and make a publication and so forth. KSEA does that too. KSEA newsletters we uh, publish three or four times a year. Um, there is uh, some evening bulletin. This is an evidence how uh, people lived in early immigrants. For instance, in February 26, 1903, Evening Bulletin says uh, they, they means the Korean immigrants, mostly uh, men. 
They appear to be hard workers, yet they are paid the least. Okay? And uh, they work from dawn to uh, sunset for 69 cents a day. I don't know. Nowadays, maybe 69 cents become uh, $69. Uh, but yet, working for 10 hours, like a six or a seven dollars uh, pay is a very low rate uh, compared to other people, uh, even nowadays. So you can imagine how hard they work, and uh, they, um, uh, you know, work uh, uh, diligently and so forth. Excuse Another, me. excuse me, Professor Chi. Three more minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, three more minutes. All right. Okay. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Um, Another interesting thing is that uh, uh, there are more men uh, compared to the women, so therefore there are picture brides and so forth, but I don't have time to go over all that. So let me uh, mention uh, briefly that uh, after World War II, uh, really the 1965 is a remarkable year that immigration law abolishes this national origin, so therefore Asians become equal footing. I think 2008, maybe another remarkable year that Obama win. That's another uh, remarkable year. And in 1965 was a year like that for the Asians uh, become equal footing with others in US. And then nowadays, I think 1987, there is a Korean immigrant peak and uh, there is a uh, Immigration Act in 1990. So therefore, nowadays around 20K per year, uh, almost in average, average that's the uh, case. Um, before I became this president-elect, I went, uh, worked like uh, around 20 years on this organization, various uh, uh, activities. So from that, I can say that the motivations and difficulties of uh, uh, early immigrants, I will say that the, uh, around uh, 1907, it's uh, earn money and then live a better life. But I think in 98, more recent, uh, thing is that the prospects of a higher standard of living and also better opportunity for child education. So education is a very important thing. They went through all these language barrier and cultural shock and economic restriction and so on. But these are relatively uh, unique uh, for Korean in the, in the sense that Indians and Philippines, they uh, use uh, English in their home country, but uh, Korea uh, didn't. And then also uh, Chinese and Japanese, they had a historically longer immigration period. They have a larger uh, group, but Koreans uh, could not be involved in that. So there is uh, some exclusion of uh, Korean immigrants uh, from Chinese and Japanese group. So therefore there is uh, no other choice. Actually, Korean um, uh, Americans, they had to join non-ethnic or multi-ethnic mainstream groups and then they had to learn from everybody, including their second generation of people, and understanding uh, more deeply the difficulties of others. I'm not going to go through all these major activities of what we are doing in this organization of Korean American uh, uh, Scientists and uh, Engineers Association, but in general, I think this is true, that the Korean Americans, uh, uh, the uh, mainstream scientists and activities, they would like to support for national math science competition for younger generations, and they give uh, scholarships, and then also they're actively involved in the local chapter activities and so forth. Uh, one of the big thing, the largest thing we are doing is the US-Korea Conference on Science and Technology, and uh, next year I'm organizing this uh, UKC 2009, it, it will be uh, the place where my university is. It's in Raleigh, North Carolina. The uh, picture shows at the Raleigh Convention Center, and it will be the middle of July. And uh, I uh, hope that the, everybody here could, can come to this meeting and then see what's going on. Uh, and this uh, conference is uh, really the human networking purpose. And the idea is uh, uh, creative minds for global sustainability sustainability next year. And uh, this year it was held in San Diego, uh, 2008, August. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, San Diego meeting was the 15th, and then ours will be 16th. 
So you can see some of these science contest uh, uh, pictures for the younger generations, how we are doing. And then this age, you can see that the 30 and 40 uh, age younger uh, generations actually dominate uh, these uh, 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 Korean scientists uh, and engineers population. So we would like to actually work more and uh, our organization would like to become a premier association to promote the application of science and technology for the general welfare of society. And then we'd like to build the international cooperation, especially between US and Korea. And we'd like to represent the majority of ethnic Korean scientists and engineers in the United States. So let me make some conclusion. Uh, from these experience that I went through, I realized that the, really the first generation was the seed for the next generation. It may be obvious, but when you actually experience, you may appreciate more deeply what it is. And uh, the first generation to be a role model, they have been very, very difficult. They went through all these difficult situations. However, I think uh, we have a deep cultural root of Korean, and we have a pride of Koreans. Uh, so therefore, we stood up on our own cultural root and the heritage from our motherland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ji. Uh, we have two uh, panel uh, here, uh, both of them are Dr. Songs. Uh, Dr. Song Young Il is the, uh, the working uh, the director of policy planning in uh, KIST, Korea Institute of Science and Technology. He has a PhD and MBA from SUNY Buffalo. And then uh, Professor Song Ha Jung is the uh, professor of the, so the School of Social Sciences, uh, teaching the uh, public administration. Uh, and he's got a PhD from John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, Dr. Song from KIST. Each. Six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for all the uh, pres presenters today. Uh, and I have the privilege to see again Dr. Pled again. Um, we met in the OECD Nano Workshop last year. And uh, I have a few uh, comments on uh, his uh, presentation and um, also a few comments for others. Um, because of time, li time limit, uh, I'll uh, go over very quickly. Uh, first of all, Dr. Pillet, um, he mentioned that the, uh, now uh, the importance of uh, uh, the mobility, in terms of mobility of highly intellectual uh, high intellectual uh, scientists and uh, uh, PhDs and masters uh, is that is that the uh, the globalization of R and D is now uh, changing, shifting toward the globalization of R and D environment, and this globalization R and D environment is very important, I believe, and uh, is associated with the concept like uh, open innovation, uh, which encourages input from outside. Uh, outside the organization as well as outside the, uh, uh, the national boundary and also global sourcing of highly skilled scientists and en engineers. Uh, I believe um, the current trend is that the, uh, the global market for the uh, intellectual uh, assets like high, highly skilled uh, PhDs and uh, uh, master's degree holders is emerging. The emergence, emergence is very obvious. And uh, in case of Korea, if you take a look, a few years ago, Korean government uh, estimated that the, uh, the shortage of skilled knowledge workers in advanced technology area, like nanotechnology or biotechnology, will be a major problem. Uh, the shortage will reach to 200,000 to 300,000 in 10 years. Um, so this shortage must be filled in some way, and I believe the shortages uh, must be filled by and large through international sourcing. And the international market for this highly skilled labor forces is because now emergent. Uh, I think it's kind of suggestion for Dr. Pillet. I think there must be some kind of coordinated effort among OECD countries to develop uh, international forum 
or in international initiative uh, to, for example, estimate the forecast of skilled laborers in, say, for 10 years, world over. And uh, uh, also, we, we must some kind of discuss about how to develop the labor forces in the world over, because the shortage is really obvious, and we, we are suffering. We Korean, uh, as a nation, we Korea as a nation is suffering from those those shortages in in, in ten years, within ten years. And uh, <clears throat> we can also discuss such issues as building database or policy implication, or the uh, uh, how to coordinate in uh, in. Uh, in making this global global labor market efficiently, things like that. So this is one thing I, I would like to uh, point out for Dr. Pilar's case, and also uh, for Dr. Chin, for Dr. Chin, uh, <clears throat> in my opinion, there's uh, some reason for the low return rate for Korean scholars. The numbers uh, might be. Uh, misleading because these days the universities in Seoul and especially in regional areas are suffering from the kind of hollowing out effect of the uh, graduate school, especially in engineering school. Uh, the application rate uh, for engineering school nowadays in regional universities and some universities in Seoul area too is less than, less than one to one. It's really uh, severe. Uh, we need to analyze the reason for that, and part of the reason, I believe, is because uh, the, the good students, good candidates for the uh, graduate school are going abroad. Uh, you know, that's probably the major reason for that. And uh, they are not returning. Uh, and so we need to analyze the, the, the reason for the hollowing out effects of graduate schools in engineering, good in engineering schools in, in Korea, and and also we need to analyze the um, how to how to fill the future demands in engineering school engineering areas, especially highly skilled areas, uh, not NT and BT or IT areas. Uh, so the focus must be shift in a sense to uh, towards the internal uh, you know system for the. Um, uh, highly skilled labor forces, and these days uh, I I know that the uh, WC world class university uh, making this WC is one issue, one big issue in in Korea. Uh, that focuses on uh, you know recruiting highly skilled labor forces in outside of Korea and bring them in, and uh, and you know giving them a good research environment, etc. But I think the the problem the problem at hand is really in domestic problems. You know, we have to somehow strengthening strengthen, as you said, strengthen the uh, the, the engineering schools in Korea now. And also, and for the uh, Dr. G, uh, uh, one of the things I noticed is that Korean government has poured many efforts, you know, to develop a diaspora network of Korean immigrants, especially in the U.S. Uh, for example, COSEN and COLIS and KSEA, or, you know, those things are some of the examples. Uh, but I was not quite sure about the visibility of these networks in the Korean community in the U.S. Uh, for example, in Silicon Valley areas, I know that thousands of Korean scientists and engineers are hired in universities or by companies, uh, but yeah, they don't know about and they don't know anything about this Cosan or Colis or things like that. In other words, not many uh, portion of these Korean immigrants or Korean highly trained uh, Koreans in uh, in the U.S. and other areas and are covered. So the networking uh, of these uh, you know Korean scientists and engineers in the U.S. and in other areas, in other, uh, you know, in, in other uh, uh, countries would be the most important thing, I, I think, the, you know, for the, would, it would be the next step for the uh, immigration 
uh, or the diaspora policy for the Korean government, I, I, I think. So those are some of the comments. OK, thank you very much. Professor Song, you have another six, six minutes too. We, four years ago, today we, we do not find noteworthy barriers for talented people getting jobs abroad. So, brains move. Some science and engineering professionals even return to their home countries after certain periods in foreign countries. Various factors make this come and go happen. We call the phenomenon brain circulation now. By touching upon somewhat different aspect of brain circulation, three pre presentations make up a knowledgeable and intriguing story. I admit that their viewpoints and compiled data are appropriate, and I agree with them in most of their analysis and resulting suggestions. Although I cannot find major drawbacks from their presentations, as a de designated discussant, I'd rather make offer some comments and raise questions for each participant. For Dr. Pilat. Dr. Pilat suggested that HRST mobility is caused by several factors. For example, economic reasons, personal family issues, research infrastructure, etc. In most cases, economic factors are known to be the most important ones underlying labor mobility. Besides economic factors, what is the most important factor to make science and engineer, scientists and engineers in particular more? What are your evaluation on the investigation on South Korea's case that concluded that K-12 education, children's education, is the most important factor to make relatively young Korean scientists and engineers stay in the States? Uh, 나머지 두분 한국 분에게는 한국말로 하겠습니다. 이게 이렇게 하는 게 공평할 것 같습니다. 진 박사님께는 간단하게 여쭤보겠습니다. 어, 우리 진 박사님께서는 이 한국 상황에 대해서 아주 정확하게 데이터를 모으시고 판단하고 하셨는데 마지막에 서제스천 부분에서 어, 몇 가지를 제시를 했습니다. 여섯 가지 포인트인가를 하셨는데 다들 아주 옳은 말씀입니다. 근데 이건 너무 컴프리엔시브, 너무 완벽해서 이것을 다 한꺼번에 수행할 수는 없을 거고 어느 부분에 말하자면 중점을 둬야 될 텐데 그 중에 첫 번째가 스트렝스닝 스트렝스닝 더 컴퓨터티브니스 오브 유니버시티스라고 그렇게 얘기를 했거든요. 이건 뭐이 브레인 드레인 문제, 브레인 서큘레이션 문제뿐만 아니라 우리 국가 전체에 살고 죽느냐 하는 그런 문제이기 때문에 이 문제를 이 이슈의 한정에서 우리 얘기할 수 있는 것은 아닌데 이런 얘기를 제시하면 은 사실은 정책 담당자들 입장에서는 별로 어떻게 할수 없는 상황이다라는 생각이 들어서 좀더 구체적인 얘기들을 제시했으면 하는 생각이 듭니다. 어, 질문, 아, 저, 코멘트 하는 시간이 짧기 때문에 우리 지 교수님께 하나 여쭤보겠습니다. 어, 지 교수님이 내년에 맡으실 KSEA라는 것은 저는 개인적으로 굉장히 그 연구가 있는 그런 조직입니다. KSEA는 1960년대와 70년대 에, 한국이 산업화되는 과정에서 정말로 중요한 역할을 했습니다. 미국에 있는 우리 과학기술자들을 한국에 연결하는 데 결정적인 역할을 했고 이 채널을 통해서 이 KSE의 조직을 통해서 많은 분들이 한국으로 돌아왔고 컨택 포인트를 만들고 있습니다. 지금도. 그런데 어, 지 교수님께 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 앞으로도 KSE가 그런 역할을 할수 있을 것인지 그 정도의 역량을 가지고 있는지 어, KSE의 멤버가 만 명이라고 했으면 만 명이면 굉장한 숫자입니다. 고급 인력 만 명이 모여 있는 조직이라면 그 조직 자체로 살아남을 만큼 어, 리소스를 동원할 수 있어야 할 텐데 과연 그렇게 할수 있는지 조금 전에 우리 다른 성공 박사님께서 말씀하셨던 것과 마찬가지로 그것 말고 또 다른 형태의 K, 에, 미국에 있는 과학기술들을 연결하는 네트워크 그런 것 등등이 있습니다. 차라리 그런 형태의 것을 제대로 지원해가지고 
지금 같은 IT 사회에서는 그것을 통해서 우리가 우리의 고급 인력을 활용하고 연결망을 형성한 것이 더 나은 게 아닌지 하는 그런 생각이 들어서 이런 질문을 드렸습니다. 고맙습니다. 예, 감사합니다. 동 박사님. 어, 오디언스 중에서 다섯 분만 질문을 받겠습니다. 또 다른 분이 있으면 표, 표지를 해 주십시오. 네, 지승용 우리 박사님께 말씀드리겠습니다. 먼저 이렇게 먼 길을 이렇게 와주시고 그리고 이렇게 쉽지 않은 그 움직이시는데 와주셔서 너무 감사드리고요. 아 그리고 한국인으로서 존경드립니다. 아, 제 질문은 음, 그 한국도 똑같은 어려움을 갖고 있는데 그 많은 인재풀 갖고 계신 걸로 알고 있어요. 그러면 과연 그 인재풀은 어떻게 지금 활용이 되고 있는지 굳이 모빌리티를 떠나서 세클레이션을 떠나서 그 인재들도 어 제가 보면 한국에 있는 인재들도 보면 어 학계에 계신 분은 자꾸 관 쪽으로 이렇게 오시려고 하고요 또이 기업체에 계신 분들도 또 음, 다시 또그 학교 교수로 가시려고 하고 하는 어 이런 불일치가 발생을 하고 있어요 그래서 과연 그 인재들은 어떤 생각들을 가지고 계시고 그거를 어떻게 해소하고 계신지가 첫 번째고요. 두 번째로는 과연 대한민국 정부가 어떻게 하면 미국에 있는 고급 인재들을 한국으로 모실 수 있는지 그 말씀을 듣고 싶습니다. 감사합니다. 네, 감사합니다. 네, 안녕하십니까. 저는 광운대학교에 다니고 있는 김영웅이라고 합니다. 일단 주제가 브레인 서큘레이션인데 서큘레이션은 제가 생각하기에 밸류의 문제라고 생각을 합니다. 결국 그 사람들이 생각하는 가치가 어떠냐에 따라서 가치 이동 때문에 서큘레이션이 발생한다고 생각을 하는데 과연 이제 그 앞에 계신 분들께 생각하시는 가치 기준이 무엇인지 첫 번째로 여쭙고 싶고요. 두 번째는 기존 경제가 붕괴되고 이제 디지털 이코노믹스화 됨에 따라서 기존 인재의 개념도 바뀌어야 된다고 생각을 하는데 제가 생각하기로는 앞으로는 인재에 대한 개념도 기존의 맥킨지에서 발표하는 인재 개념이 아니라 가치를 만들어내는 사람 또는 인재가 모여진 시스템의 개념이 될 거라고 생각을 합니다. 그래서 브레인 서큘레이션의 개념도 글로벌에서 이제 로컬로 가는 개념이 아니라 어떤 이제 로컬에서 글로벌로도 충분히 서큘레이션이 일어날 수도 있고 그리고 굳이 글로벌이 아니더라도 우리나라 같은 로컬에서도 디지털 이코노믹스한 어떤 인터넷 인프라가 있기 때문에 그걸로 충분히 어떤 뉴 패러다임을 만들 수 있다고 생각을 하는데 거기에 대해서 한번 어떻게 생각하신지 두 번째 질문입니다. 예, 감사합니다. 다른 분 질문 없으세요? 질문이 있으면 표해 주시고 없으시면 어, 메인 스피커 3세분 돌아가시면서 원 미닛 정도로 해주시기 바랍니다. 예, 저는 지금 학생들을 가리키고, 아, 가리키고 있는 사람인데요. 요즘 우리 나라 교육부터 말씀을 드리면 아이들이 열심히 공부해서 특목고를 가서 아이비리그 쪽으로 지금 많이 빠지고 있거든요. 근데 중요한 거는 뭐 브레인 서클레이션도 중요한데 지금 아이들이 뭐 예전보다 뭐 애국심이 조금 부족하다고 표현하면 적절치 않을 수도 있는데 그런 부분들이 좀 있어요. 그래서 외국으로 나가서 공부를 해서 외국에서 자리 잡으려고 하는 부분은 강한데 오히려 돌아와서 나라의 발전을 위하거나 이런 부분이 대단히 지금 떨어지고 있는 걸로 저는 알고 있어요. 그래서 그런 부분에 대한 생각을 조금 많이 해주셔야 되는 부분이 아닌가 이런 부분을 좀 생각을 해서 만약 거기에 의견을 주실 수 있으면 좀 주셨으면 좋겠습니다. 아무리 브리프, 아무리 브리프, pick up the, the, the questions which uh, were raised earlier on. Um, first, the, the, the whole issue of globalization. I think what, partly why international mobility is uh, so important at the moment, I think because it's, a, it's part of a, a trend of, of globalization of R&D and innovation more broadly. So I think we have to see it in, in that context as well. I think we, we actually just recently also uh, put out a report on, on open innovation, which was what, what Dr. Song was talking about. And there as well, I think you see a different model, a different approach to, to innovation emerging in companies and in, in, in that context as well, companies need mobility as well. They need people who can 
operate in different environments, who are, have been exposed to different environments. So that is another reason, I think, why international mobility is, is important. Um, uh, Dr. Song talked about uh, sort of, uh, well, uh, how can we, can we fill all of this to international sourcing? And I, my, my, my argument would be no, we can't, because basically many of the countries which are currently important sources of, of, of supply to, to many of the OECD countries uh, are also countries where currently there is a lot of development of R&D uh, going on themselves. So basically a lot of these countries will actually, uh, more and more of these people will be needed in, in, in those countries themselves. So we will probably uh, see more circulation. We still will see more people uh, moving across countries. We will see a lot of international sourcing, but we also need to look at our own supply system in, 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 in many countries, and particularly uh, many uh, countries in the OECD area, particularly the United States, really has problems in trying to generate their own people uh, to who can who can fill in, in, into uh, uh, fill the gaps in in, in, in the supply of researchers. Um, the second point uh, by, by by the other Dr. Song was about uh, some of the factors driving mobility, and 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 there I'm not sure if for scientists economic incentives are always the most important. I think it matters. Of course, you want to have a, a good salary, you want to have, have a decent uh, standard of living, but I think for many people what also matters is the environment in which they're operating. Can they really do their research? Can they really uh, generate very high productivity research? And I think that was uh, very interesting, uh, I think, in the presentation by Dr. Jin, where uh, basically uh, the, the reasons why uh, some uh, Korean researchers are not coming back to Korea is because they feel their research productivity will suffer. And, and I think that is an interesting factor. Why, why is this happening? Why is this the case? Is it because basically uh, there is not enough of an environment yet for where, where really other highly skilled scientists are, are operating? And that, of course, will only take time to, to, to change where people will actually, where people will feel comfortable in that environment. So it will take time, I think. It, it's not something which will happen very easily. Um, that's probably all I'll, I'll, I'll have time to say. I'd like to f uh, emphasize uh, sustainable human resource development. You know, as I told, I mentioned that it's very important to recruit to attract people. But the more important thing is to uh, make them you know, work and the research very uh, the proper way, so that they, their creativity and their resources uh, can be used properly. Properly, so. In that sense, the university is a very, very important source to attract the human resources from um, at present and, and also the students who will be future, the highly skilled. So it takes long, I, I mean, it is very hard and very difficult and takes a long time to improve the university system. But that's uh, the long, I mean, basic, uh, basic things to be done. Uh, to uh, to do to have uh, uh, sustainable human resources development, and then uh, actually the young generations are very very different in terms of their value systems. You know, uh, they are very I mean relatively they have less I mean very weak, weaker uh, weaker emotions uh, about nationality and uh, national borders. And wherever, I mean, uh, the place is a goal place is uh, better for their quality, their life and their research. They are moving around. I think it's a, um, it's a difficult to change the trend. It's trained, so we have to. I think we have to uh, accept that, and then uh, accepting that, and then make some uh, strategy and policies uh, to adapt that uh, the trend. Yeah, I think that I got uh, several different questions, but I think uh, it all comes down to the really the fundamental issue. I think human uh, movement, all those things are based on the human minds. I think that uh, uh, the key uh, of all uh, the successful programs and uh, uh, policies and all that is to uh, revive what should be the, uh, the correct human minds. The correctness uh, should come with, uh, we should know uh, each other's uh, talents. I think we have to really find out uh, what is our talent. I think we know yourself. I mean, that's uh, really the basic bottom line, I think. I think we should know the nature, and we should know what the nature wants. That's why we are talking about all this green energy and uh, 
uh, green sustainability and so forth. I mean, we have to have this uh, global sustainability. And those things, because it's a human mind, I think uh, Dr. Song uh, asked about uh, you know, Silicon Valley example uh, uh, of why we don't have too many uh, of these type of uh, uh, you know, collaboration among the Korean uh, scientists and engineers. I think uh, the reason is that these type of association is coming like uh, uh, colligating the uh, airs and then make uh, water and so forth. It's like a self-organizing systems. So therefore, it's uh, all volunteer uh, work. So therefore, it's very difficult. You know, each people have their uh, own living, but they have uh, human minds and they uh, look at more broadly about what nature wants, and then they look at their own talents. And this uh, uh, organization that I'm, uh, I, I will uh, run uh, next year is, in, fa in fact, we'd like to see each one's talent and uh, uh, make a sort of a coherence among these talents. Like a, um, uh, uh, the wavelength has to be almost uh, similar so that we have a synergetic effect to make a, a much bigger uh, creativity and a much bigger project we can organize. So I think that the, uh, in my point of view, that uh, I think human minds is uh, really the thing that we have to think about and we have to figure out what our talents are and based on the talents, uh, we have to fit together. And this, uh, uh, so therefore, uh, you know, the fast people and the slow people, they come together and make uh, almost a similar speed, then that makes a huge effect and that coherence of the uh, human minds and uh, uh, adapting uh, properly to the nature, I think this is the key, I think, uh, for the success in my mind. Yeah, 감사합니다. Uh, 늦은 시간까지. Yeah, 늦은 시간까지, uh, 감사하고요. 그리고 어, 우리 끝나기 전에 우리 메인 스피커하고 패널로 수고하신 여러분들께 우리 박수로 어, 주시기 바랍니다. <웃음>